Okay, we are live. Hello, everybody. Depending on where you are, good morning, good evening, or good night. I hope you all had a nice stretch with the previous yoga session. And well, my name is Servando. I'm going to cover a little bit of a progress over the last year for 96 boards, uh, mainly what uh, we have been doing on the AutoWare.io project, specifically on the PCU, the perception control unit, which I will present in a little bit. And just let's get started. Well, as I said, my name is Servando German Serrano. So I'm a Spanish engineer. That's a young me from over seven or eight years ago. I'm a software applications engineer within Linaro, uh, the 96 boards team. And from my background, I have uh, been working on random robotics and autonomous systems uh, from quadcopters, submarines, and, and ground rovers. So uh, just a year ago, actually, was I was checking, uh, and it was 24th March 2020, on the on the first uh, Linaro Tech Days, I presented the progress that we had come across from the previous year, so 2019 to 2020, on on AutoWare and what we had been doing. And uh, here, just a little bit of a recap. I had been working with uh, different SOCs, uh, getting ready for ROS2 and AutoWare. If you recall from the previous presentations and if you're familiar with AutoWare, I was at that point, it was mainly AutoWare.ai built on ROS1. And what we wanted is be sure that the range of 96 boards would be able to support uh, ROS2 and AutoWare.auto, which was a, a clean rewrite of, of AutoWare using ROS2. So what we did was uh, mainly work on uh, Hiking 970, Dragon Ball 45 c through the RB3 kit, Ultra 96 as well. Um, if I recall correctly, those are the main ones that I used. Uh, here, for example, what we wanted to check is that we could run uh, real-time tasks on, on the boards. And, and here we can see we took the ROS2 real-time demo at that point, which has changed a little bit in terms of what it can do. But at that point, what I did was uh, patch the preempt RT Linux kernel onto the Hiking 970 and as well onto the Dragon Board. Uh, for the Hiking 970, it was a normal uh, kernel patching and everything. But for the Dragon Board as well, we overlapped on top uh, Docker image because uh, we were using Debian Buster and there was it, there was no support for ROS2 on the onto Debian Buster, so we we but a uh, Docker image uh, with, with Ubuntu, I think, to, to run the ROS2 real-time demo. And here we basically compare with two of the DDS implementation, which is the middleware that uh, is being used for ROS2 at the moment, namely Fast RTPS, which is Fast DDS now, and Cyclone DDS. And what we basically checked is that, apart from a spike at the start of the demo, mainly due to memory allocations and that sort of stuff, we were quite well below within the maximum jitter that was allowed for the for the demo. So that was that was positive news in terms that we could do some real time work in the future. And as well, everything is uh, documented in the blog post within the 96 ports website. And we provided that building step towards other contributors or people working on on higher end applications. At least all the initial setup and configuration, you can just go to the blog post, go through that, and, and get it uh, all sorted out. Apart from this, uh, we as well run different workloads within AutoWare. Uh, what was available, so for AutoWare.ai, it's a, it's a software stack for autonomous vehicles. So, as of course, uh, we cannot run everything within one board, so we selected specific demos. And what was available at the moment for AutoWare.auto was a subset of, of components. And here I've taken the 3D perception software stack demo for AutoWare.auto, which where we had a data file from a Velodyne LiDAR, uh, fed that through the through the LiDAR drivers written in ROS2, and we did some ground uh, point perception and box uh, cloud no cloud point cloud uh, clustering apart from some Euclidean clustering that is not shown here. Apart from that, in, we have a blog series on, on AutoWare, which is called AutoWare Everywhere, where we, we recall 
everything that we have been doing. And for AutoWare.ai in particular, we have shown as well how to do some mapping, doing some using uh, Rosback data and some localization within the map using the NDT matching uh, algorithm, which takes a point cloud from the LiDAR that you are feeding, a point cloud map, 3D point cloud map, and actually outputs the, the current location of the of the car itself. As I said, we tried everything on, on different uh, SOCs within the 96 boards ecosystem because we didn't have a uh, specific hardware from the AutoWare.io project. And actually, we announced uh, it came out uh, soon before the Linaro Tech Days on 2020. This is AutoCore's PCU, which is the first board within the AutoWare.io project. I have taken here uh, what is currently available for, for, for the PCU at the moment. Well, at, at that time, at that point in time, it, we had an, an, an image with Ubuntu 18, ROS2 Dashing, and ROS1. But if you go onto, onto the resource page, which uh, Autocore provides a ton of, of information and how to, uh, apart from different tools and, and set up on how to, to do things with it, to get it ready up and running with, it, with Autocore with the PCU. The last and the latest image that we have been using contains Ubuntu 20.04 with ROS2 Foxy. Apart from that, uh, the, this image actually has as well the pre MTRT patch enabled uh, with, within it. So you could have a soft real time system up and running in a matter of like 10, 5 to 10 minutes that takes to, to burn the, the to flash the SD card. Apart from that, since this, is a, this board is an MPU MCU combination, they provide an image with free RTOS and a lightweight simulator that you can run on, on Windows. I think they have provided that a version for Linux as well now to, to do some hardware in the loop and as well some optimized autoware nodes for the for the PCU. In here, uh, some of you might be missing some AI and, and neural networks and that sort of stuff. And they provide a PCIe uh, support. So you could potentially get a Google Coral or a TPU and plug it in and run all Neural network and that sort of that sort of things with uh, workloads within the within the PCU as well. The nice thing about the PCU is that it's auto grade, so you could potentially run things on your board. I have one here which Jan brought from from China just before the lockdown, and I managed to to steal, and which has been a little bit of a nightmare and a dream at points that I will cover a bit later. But basically, you can do your development on the board. It's uh, and then just try and deploy on the on a vehicle because it has all the interfaces that you would expect for a for a vehicle can interface all the the bus sort of range uh, i don't know if you can see here maybe not the best and so it basically comes joins all the development and actual deployment afterwards and as i said uh, in this presentation i'm going to be covering all the work that i have been doing in the past year on the pcu uh starting with the ARM autonomy Yocto layer, which this was was so this was one of the first nightmares with the board, uh, coming basically because I haven't hadn't used the Yocto project before, so it was a little bit of a steep learning curve uh, with it. But basically, what we tried is uh, we managed to enable the ARM autonomy Yocto layer, which provides a hypervisor solution for autonomous systems. It's uh, it's uh, fully available. It's all public and available, and basically contains all recipes and classes for host and guest systems. Instead of using the default boards that are suggested within the documentation of ARM of ARM autonomy, we managed to unravel the NXP Flex Builder tool to to put together an image together uh, using ARM autonomy. And for those of you that rather watch the movie than go through the book, we as well have a video blog post of uh, everything is included in the blog post, but there's a video here with all the different steps whoops, that you would need to, to get the image up and going in an easy and chunky manner. So basically it's a five minute video on how to get things going. Apart from that, so moving on from, from ARM autonomy, we wanted to test as well the real time capabilities and, and get it ready for real time uh, workload. And as I mentioned, since we already had preemptrt. Uh, the preemptrt patch. It wouldn't make much sense to just have a video of flashing the the board and then just running this. So instead, we took uh, Xenomine uh, version three 
on on firstly which was quite a straightforward or the mercury core which is a single kernel approach and basically you build xenomai alongside the preempt rt patch and for that you there's a quite a straightforward just need to download the sources from the next branch in order to target arc 64 architecture for for the board and what we did uh we build the xenomai and run the cyclic test we need to check that uh what is the maximum latency that we were getting and as you can see here, what we were getting is was around 120 microseconds, which is uh, quite nice. Uh, but we wanted these to compare as well with the cobalt uh, kernel, which is a pure dual kernel approach. Uh, for this one, it was a bit, a bit of a hiccup at the start. So uh, as a bit of a background, I'm running Ubuntu 20 on my laptop, and I was able to patch uh, the iPipe uh, on the on the default Linux kernel for for the PCU, but if you try to do the same for the using Ubuntu 18, which you would need to use the NXP Flex Builder tool that I, that I was using for cross compiling the kernel for the PCU, as well from the auto core sources because everything is uh, there to to just grab and, and run without much customization. But because the PCU kernel is a little bit customized, if you would try to do that. In Ubuntu 18, it would uh, break uh, because it was missing stuff, uh, mis misalignments between the uh, what the iPipe patch was trying to target within the Linux kernel sources. So basically, what we have done is we provided a modified iPipe patch uh, for anybody to just go around, just download, patch the kernel, and you can basically use the Flex Builder tool to build uh, the the patch kernel. And then as what we did with uh, Mercury with Mercury Core, the main Cobalt libraries for, for Xenomai are built directly on the PCU. And in here, in this gig, basically I show that after building the Cobalt kernel, you need to boot it. And here we had it running all, all fine. And as we did with, uh, with Mercury, we run the cyclic test again. Uh, but in this case, we got a maximum of around 20 microseconds, which that's coming of depending on this is a hard real time capabilities that we can achieve on, on the PCU now coming from from cinema depending on the way you go so you get around 120 or 20 microseconds which is quite a quite a low a low latency for the for for the real time tasks moving on from for the from real time uh we wanted to check if we could have a distributed sort of auto wear running on on the board and maybe on the multiple boards in the future uh, to do that we had a look at kubernetes first thing that we needed to do is check whether actually adding the kubernetes infrastructure impacted the the performance on the on we took the cyclone dds to to assess this and to have because the idea basically instead of having the full auto wear software stack because if you go to the to the documentation and everything, you will have everything running on the same place. What you want is to be able to manage every module independently as a, as a service. Once you have a stable software, there is no need to actually manually manually kicking off nodes and, and that sort of stuff. So we wanted to have a, a little bit of an orchestration abstraction onto it. So as I said, the first thing that we did was checking that the Kubernetes cluster was not impacting the performance. And we compared with uh, manually running the containers using the Cyclone DDS performance tool. Here we can see that basically we have the same throughput and, and, and rate. So we verified that there is no there is no problem of adding uh, Kubernetes onto the onto the mix, which uh, we were expecting. We can do this basically because uh, with the DDS there is a serverless uh, masterless discovery within the different nodes that uh, talk to each other which means that we don't need to go around setting IPs for, for every pod or manually within, within a Kubernetes cluster, which is one of the benefits for, of ROS2 against ROS1 as well. So once we check this up, we had a little bit of a, a break from the PCU and we started, we collaborated a little bit with, with Tier 4 and the new AutoWare architecture proposal, which is a bit of a cleanup on the original AutoWare.ai, actually clarifying the role of each module, uh, identifying the interfaces and, and making sure that each module does uh, a particular thing. And what we did was a little bit of porting work for from ROS1 to ROS2. 
of the software stack while at the same time auto where auto was was being developed uh, coming to a to a release which i will cover in a bit so as as uh, we were waiting for for auto where auto for the first release of auto where auto the guys from tier 4 sent across a rosback data file that they recorded using the new architecture and what we did in here is making uh, checking that having two pods uh, managed through Kubernetes, we could play the ROS back on one pod and the other one would be able to listen as well. So we can see here there's a deployment YAML file that it's uh, fully uh, fully public and kicks off the ROS back deployment and a ROS topic echo deployment. And on on this end, these are all both running on the on the PCU. We can see that the it's possible to, to echo the, the topics without any influence or, or any manually setting anything apart from getting the cluster up and running. Follow that, uh, we we as well published and used the laptop for visualization to make sure that we can as well extract the, the information from the Kubernetes cluster. And this is basically having the master node running on the laptop and a worker node from Kubernetes running on the on the PCU. And Using RBs, we can actually visualize the, the LiDAR data that is being published in the system, which is quite handy, but not as far from what we want on a, on, a, on, on a real vehicle. Effectively, we are just getting a, a data file and replaying it, which is not doing anything meaningful with it. That's basically because the new architecture is not as mature as uh, we would need to have a point cloud map and everything that we didn't have at the moment. So we, we this is the what we showed at the moment, but at least it goes from having the DDS performance tool step further, actually adding cross nodes in the mix and making sure that everything can talk to each other and, and the rates are, are fine and everything. Follow from that, so we had uh, so Auto World Auto was uh, released after well the, the AVP demo was happened on October 2020. And these are the software packages that were Available are available at the moment for the coming from the autonomous valley parking demo, which is a localization using the entity with the Veloline driver, obstacle detection, planning and motion control, and they developed everything using the LGS VL simulator. There are a couple of videos here of the car running autonomously. Uh, this was done, it was a little bit of a delay as well due to, to COVID because everybody taking care of masks and, and social distancing. But we can see that the vehicle actually stops when there is an obstacle. And in this video, it manages to go to the parking spot that it needs to be and park itself autonomously. So once this is completed, we was the one of the milestones for the for the first ODD for, for Auto World Auto. And after a little bit of a cleanup, so we go a little bit further, basically the car stops itself into the parking spot. What we did, uh, so Auto World Auto version 1.0.0 was released. And since we had a, a ton of software now that we could try in ROS2, we took the Kubernetes further and actually did the, what I showed initially on the multi SOC. So instead of using the high key and the, and the Dragon Board, we used the PCU to run the Auto, Auto World Auto 3D perception stack, but in a distributed way. So instead of having everything running manually from one container. We have three Docker images, individual ones, individual ones for each deployment. So it's are, are separated and smaller than what you would expect for a full auto or auto build, which means that this is as well to roll updates in the, in the future and everything. And basically what we have mainly is the UDP replay deployment, which actually replaced the, the Velodyne pickup data. A sensing deployment, which kicks off the two drivers the for the front and the rear Velodyne uh, LiDARs. And another one, which is a little bit big, so this one could be uh, split as well into, into individual ones, which mainly do all the perception, which is takes care of the, transforms the point cloud, uh, no, uh, the point cloud, identifies which ones uh, belong to the ground and in order to be able to remove it, and as well uh, performing a clustering of the, of the points uh, in order to identify different uh, objects and, and draw bounding boxes around them. So as I said, everything is tagged uh, for version 1.0.0. These are the three Docker images that we have for for the 
for the different deployments. And what we did uh, first was just, uh, as opposed to manually kicking off everything, we can just run them as a little bit of a service within the Kubernetes and kick off the, all the deployments. And once uh, all of them are running, we can as well check that everything using laptop for the visualization, check that everything is running fine. And in here, what I did, I used the host network parameter within Kubernetes to be able to publish everything on my local network here at home. And just having a ROS2 uh, terminal running RBs on, on my laptop, I was able to get all the topics that were running through the network. So that's uh, from the client clustering, all the ground points, non-ground points, etc. After doing this, we had, a, I think, a little bit of a confusion of what's the benefit between doing uh, running this using Kubernetes as opposed to plain Docker, for example. And apart from not needing to have four different terminals to set everything manually, which we do here from the from the master node, we come into scalability issues and 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 how we can do that and, and achieve that. So, as a bit of a showcase, we took a combo of the PCU plus the RB3, so the Dragon Board A45C, where we want to assume that we are in a vehicle now and we have the lidars plug onto the RBC because we want to do some pre-processing, for example. And the main board is the PCU, which is, is a bit more hardcore, and we can actually run the higher higher end loads on the on the PCU. So what we did here is actually show how we can run just the doing exactly the same the UDP replay uh, deployment and the sensing deployment on the RB3 and all the other ones on the perception 3D deployment on on the PCU and making sure that everything runs fine and there is no need to do any for the manual intervention to manage the, the whole cluster. So after creating the cluster, which we get the, the RB3 and the, and the PCU joined into the, into the whole Kubernetes cluster, we modify the deployment files, uh, taking the name of each one, you see the node, node name parameter. So in here for the UDP replay, we use the linear lib, which is the name of the, of the RB3. The same for the sensing for each of the, because here we have basically two deployments for each of the sensing for the LiDAR drivers. And we use the PCU for the perception demo uh, deployment. After this, we can basically, as we did before, kick off the three deployments, apply them using the Kubernetes infrastructure, and making sure that everything is running what it needs to run which can be easily see here. So basically this one, the perception 3D in the PCU and the other ones on the RB3. And to check that everything was running properly, we did the same. So basically took the laptop, since everything is being published on the local network, just checking that everything runs fine. Here on the, just getting all the different topics that we had before, in exactly the same way with no issues whatsoever. So here we try to show as well how we can introduce redundancies. So you might have multiple boards on the on the vehicle, or you might just want to make sure that your software uh, modules are, are being handled appropriately. So if uh, if uh, one of them dies, Kubernetes will take care of, of respawning it again, and that sort of stuff. In so we're able to deploy updates and and that sort of things, rolling updates for for the different modules. It's something that we haven't explored yet, but we are looking into doing the near future. And that basically takes me to the end of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you all for your time. I know if there are any questions or, or anything to cover, please, uh, please ask or if not, just ping us a message or an email and, and we'll be happy to, to reply to everything. Thanks, Savando. We have a minute left if someone wants to put something in the chat. Uh, that was a great talk. Okay, seems it was all perfectly clear. <laughs> so thanks to everyone. Uh, we'll close this session now and the next one will start in five minutes. Yeah, Young was happy, so all good.